Chief Justice of Nigeria swears in Bola Ahmed Tinubu as Nigeria's 16th president. My administration must create meaningful opportunities for our youth. We shall honor our campaign commitment. Traditional and religious institutions pledge support for new administration, urge Nigerians to prioritize national interest. Collectively, irrespective of party, irrespective of religion. Nigerians hail smooth transition of power, applaud the nation's democracy. And good morning, Nigeria. Today, of course, we shall be discussing President uh, Tinubu's inaugural address and the takeaways therein. All right. And uh, the kingmaker, like he is called in some quarters, has finally become the king. In a history-making event, Bola Tinubu took the oath of office as the 16th president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria amid tight security at the 5,000 capacity Eagle Square in the nation's capital. The president was sworn in by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, His Lordship Kayode Ariwola, at a ceremony that had dignitaries from all around the globe. Yes, indeed. And against the backdrop of an ailing economy and the fragile security sector, President Bola Metinibu, while taking the oath of office, promised to discharge his duties as president in line with the constitution of the country and to the best of his ability. In a reassuring body language, also promised to serve without prejudice, but rather with compassion and amity towards all. Now, the ceremony was viewed across the length and breadth of Nigeria and in the diaspora. And the president, in his inaugural address, asked the, a pertinent question on whether to remain faithful to the work herein or build a better society or retreat into the shadows of a met potential. Obviously, highly spirited, he says, for me, there is but one answer. We are too great a nation and too grounded uh, as a people to rob ourselves of our finest destiny. Observers have the view that the renewed hope agenda, of course, uh, which was again highlighted in, in the inaugural speech, is significant, making headlines around the world and especially in the domestic media. Now, the president's speech also touched on the issues of economy, job security, job creation, uh, agriculture, fuel subsidy, infrastructure, monetary policy, as well as foreign policy. The president declared that fuel subsidy is gone with affirmations that uh, this government will rather channel funds into infrastructure and other areas to strengthen the economy, adding that a unified exchange rate is guaranteed. Well, he regretted the uh, monetary policy rate, and of course, the president says that it is too high and has uh, consequently put businesses in distress. Now, there were also promises he made with regard to budgetary and industrial reforms with a plan to review multiple taxation and other anti investment policies, which hitherto had been the bane of investment drive. His plans on job creation is buttressed through giving youth opportunities to thrive with commitments to one million jobs in digital economy. In agriculture, the former Lagos state governor gave assurance on minimum prices for particular produce to curb food price inflation, uh, end extreme poverty, and make food more abundant with the creation of agricultural hubs across the country. On infrastructure, Bola Ahmed Tinibu emphatically revealed he will continue with former President Buhari's legacies 
Uh, today on Good Morning Nigeria, we are focusing our attention on the inauguration address of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu and all the salient issues with our panel of girls which we are going to assemble this morning. I am Kirian Umayo. Welcome to Good Morning Nigeria and it's good to see you again. And I'm Kingsley Osanolo. I join my colleague Kirian to welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria. We're live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority, broadcasting from our headquarters studios in Abuja. It's our second edition for the week, and Kirian is also the second day for the yeah, new of president course. of <laughs> the Federal Republic in yeah. office. Our complimentary segments, as yours always, will come in, and those include newspaper review and business. For now, we'll take the highlights of the morning news with our colleague, Frama Paye. Good morning, Frama. Good morning, Kirian. Good morning, Kingsley. Good morning, Nigerians. Here is the morning news. Hope for a renewed vigor and greater prosperity for Nigeria resounded as Bola Ahmed Tinubu was sworn in as the 16th leader of the country. President Tinubu and his second in command, Kashim Shetima, took the oath of office at the Eagle Square, Abuja. My administration must create meaningful opportunities for our youth. We shall honor our campaign commitment of one million jobs and the digital economy. Traditional and religious leaders who were in their numbers at the Eagle Square for the inauguration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu have pledged their support for the new administration, urging Nigerians to close ranks and place national interests above parochial interests. It is my hope and prayer that Nigerians will embrace this administration collectively irrespective of party, irrespective of religion, irrespective of our tribes. I believe that at this season, this is who God wants us to have. I believe that the love for our nation should be above everything else. It's a new dawn and Nigerians visibly elated express their views on the presidential inauguration ceremony and their expectations from the new administration. <coughs> I want the government to improve in creating more jobs for the graduates. To be able to work on the welfare and well-being of Nigerians, to fight insecurity, to fight poverty. I wish the government a very sustainable uh, tenure and a much better tenure than the one that has just passed. Now, democracy is taking its root deep into the Nigerian soil, and an indication of this is the smooth transition of power from the Buhari administration to the Bola Ahmed Tinubu administration. I think we should congratulate um, ourselves and thank God that uh, we are in the seventh uh, democratic transition. That is an excellent testimony to democracy taking roots in our country. A lot of patriotism, commitment to a nation for you to say, okay, my time is up, let me put it down, and I go. And then someone else take over from me. And from states across the Federation are reports from our correspondents. The newly elected and returning governors took to different pavilions to take oath of office for fresh mandate. Over the next four years, this administration we will move on speedily to deliver on all the dividends of democracy to our people. We are all at five moments, first before politics. Politics, therefore, must not separate or severe the ties of our brotherhood. And that's the news for now. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Kingsley and Kieran after this break. My son has always dreamt of being in the spotlight. That's why I give him Born Vita for everyday vitality. That gives him the strength to pursue his dreams. Born Vita, strength to dream. Your skill is key to your professional growth in the competitive broadcast media industry. Take advantage of the following programs specially packaged by NTA Television College JAWS to upgrade your skill. Computer General Application Date 8 May to 19 May 2023 Two weeks. English Grammar and Pronunciation for Broadcasters Date 22 May to 9 June 2023 Three weeks. Basic Broadcast Accounting and Auditing Date 
22nd May to 9th June 2023, three weeks. Marketing in the era of digital broadcast. Date 13th June to 23rd June 2023, two weeks. Drama production workshop. Date 3rd July to 21st July 2023, three weeks. Intermediate online news reporting skills. Date 24th July to 11th August 2023, three weeks. The course fee for the two week course is 120,000 naira, while the fee for the three week course is 150,000 naira only. Accommodation inclusive. All courses will hold at NTA Television. College near Old Government House, Rayfield, Jules. For further inquiries, please call 0803-079-5335 or 0806-980-9807. NTA Television College, Jules. Training you to be the best you want to be. Registrar, announcer. The Council of Our Fathers. My advice to these young people is please uh, do not take us back to those harrowing days you probably do not know what it is. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. All right, thank you for joining us on Good Morning Nigeria today. Next is business news. And let's join Alika Obanachi Arua for details and more. Akinwumi, additional, has employed the new Nigerian leader, President Bola Ahmed Tinebo, to make pinpoint fixing microeconomic and fiscal stability of the country as his major takeoff assignment. Dr. Additional noted that unless the economy is revived and fiscal challenges addressed boldly, resources to develop will not be there. Debt is paid using revenue and Nigeria's revenues have been declining. Nigeria earns revenue today to serve its debt and not to grow. Meanwhile, a new study by cybersecurity company, SoftShark, has revealed that a total of 82,000 accounts, representing 64%, were leaked in Nigeria, which ranks the country the 32nd most breached country from January to March in quarter one of 2023. The report noted that globally, a total of 41.6 million accounts were breached in quarter one of 2023, with Russia ranking first and amounting to a sixth of all breaches from January to March. The United States takes second place, while Taiwan appears in third place after extreme quarter over quarter growth, followed by France and Spain, a 49% decrease in breached users worldwide is seen compared to quarter four of 2022. With business news, Alika Opanachi, Arua. Thank you very much, Alika Opanachi, Arua, for the business package. And good morning, Nigeria. A review of some of the papers we have this morning comes up next. And here already we have uh, Chukudi Ukoli Waja with us as always. Uh, Chukudi, good to see you. Uh, I've not been around for a while, you know, so I've been itching <laughs> to, to host you again on this. Uh, Thank you, Kiri. And you know the feeling is mutual. All this time I come here and you say you're happy to see me. I'm happy <laughs> to see you as well. And of course, Kingsley. How are you, yeah. Kingsley? I'm very well. I, I should be welcoming you. Uh, yeah, you keep reminding me. I should, uh, the point is, I'm almost. In the mood to usurp your duties. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have uh, uh, three papers guys. here. Yeah, plus, uh, of course, what Chukudi has over there. Uh, that's the leadership newspaper. But I have Blueprint uh, for a start. And uh, let's go uh, from top to bottom. Uh, Media Mogul, Dokbesi dies at 7 to 1. Tinibu, Atiku, PDP, others, Mon. That's on page 24. Dangote, Otedola, Ovia, others, Rake 506 billion naira as dividends in 2022. Inauguration of 16th president. Uh, NLC kicks as Tinibu phases out fuel subsidy. 
Uh, three riders to that. President hints on review of Naira design, a unified exchange rate. Don't share money as poverty alleviation, according to experts. Now, petrol stations hike pump price to 300 Naira per litre in Edo. You get all that on page six. All right. Um, the photo story, of course, is that of uh, Bola Amitinibu, the president, uh, being sworn in yesterday. But below that, we have other stories. Uh, Bagu sets 11 point agenda to reposition Niger. Federal government appoints DCG Wora Ola, acting immigration CG. Abdul Razak okays six month maternity leave scholarship for quarants. Um, at the bottom, new governors pledge better deals for states amid debt burden. Uh, Obasani inherits 80.60 billion naira. At about $577 million, local foreign debts, Mutwang, $200 billion. Also, on page six. Okay, so let's get. Uh, you have another five Yes, yes okay, right. that one I will be uh, uh, fast on this. That's the leadership newspaper uh, above the name plug. Of course, that's the. It carries the. Uh, Raymond Dobesi's uh, death. Uh, President Atiku Obaseki, others mourn as Raymond Dobesi dies. On page seven. Buhari. Finally, return to rousing welcome in Daura on page six. Now, for the list of leadership, is just uh, on the uh, inauguration. So, Tinibu Hill's ground running leads critical reforms, namely to focus on economy, power, agriculture, and security, fuel subsidy gone, double taxation, interest, exchange rates for review. Don't rush to remove subsidy, Nupeng warns. UK, US, Saudi Arabia envoys in bilateral meeting with president. In states, governors make commitment to good governance. See special inographic, of course, are the photos uh, that we have. All right, at the bottom of the paper, subsidy removal. Nigerians may pay 700 naira a liter for petrol from July. It's on page 22. National airports named after Awolowo, Okadibo, Danfodio, and others. You get others on page 7. Okay, we also have the Punch newspaper, and above its nameplate, three headlines. My cabinet members feared being jailed by Buhari. That's according to former President Goodluck Jonathan. Government eyes $4 billion from Abuja and Kano Airports concession. Tinubu, Obaseki, and others mourn as Topesi dies at 71. The list story has a double-decker headline and three riders. Nigeria won't break up, says Tinubu, meets U.S., U.K., and Saudi Arabia envoys. President says Nigeria will continue to exist, promises not to be a dictator. Ipman opposes fuel subsidy removal and queues resurface in Abuja, Lagos, and others. Biden writes President Tinubu, says Nigeria's success is world's success. And the photographs there on the front page are from the inauguration ceremony yesterday. I'll probe 241 billion naira debt inherited from Ganduje. That's according to the Kano state governor. That's the new governor. Five die as car crashes into Kogi Canal. Alia freezes Benway accounts, pledges workers' welfare. Chikudi. Thank you, Kinsley. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Again, we are happy that we had a, a smooth transition from the previous government. Uh, look at the adjective we are using, previous, just uh, 12 hours ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's live. It keeps moving. Mm -hmm. It's a um, uh, moving train. Now, Tinubu hits ground running less critical reforms. This should actually be the first focus of Nigerians. People are going to look out for the first actions of the incumbent president at the moment because a lot of things need to be looked at again a lot of things need to be redressed a lot of new thinking you know needs to be injected into the system the whole uh, you know target of it uh, the target the ultimate target of it is to ensure that the economy picks up life that uh, does not move towards the uh, life support machine at all. Because uh, some people are saying that a lot could have been done to get the economy better and all that. But then you, you can't really 
put a finger of accusation on any particular person, particularly when you see two economists come on television and give you two different views about how to develop the country. So it's not as easy as that. One's, uh, one's uh, hope is that uh, President Ahmed Bola Tinubu has done enough consultation, has done enough soul searching, because the will of the individual matters a lot in pushing, you know, the, the, the action you, 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 you're pursuing home. So it matters how much will the president is going to inject into this. And I want to think that a man who has announced long ago that he has been, had, has been interested in ruling this country definitely must have come prepared. So just as we said yesterday, you were not around, we said the right thing to do now is to give a very positive outlook to what happened on May 29th, that's yesterday, mm. and wish as well, not just the president. If things are not moving well for the government, I tell you, it's going to rub off on you as, a, as an individual, yeah. as a citizen. Now, the contentious issue here is uh, the, the, the fuel subsidy uh, that has to go. It's contentious in the sense that Nigerian workers are saying, if you remove fuel subsidy, <laughs> our salaries practically wouldn't be enough to even take us to the office at all and, and back. So it's going to be a dialogue, you know, process, a, a process of dialogue handling this. Because the cost of protestation, if this happens, or when this happens, might begin to outweigh the benefits that are, that, that are being planned. So I always say that labor and government, all the interested parties, must keep dialogue at the center of, the, of their mind. I like it. A president that comes and does not have a list of what he wants to do, I'll tell you, is not serious. So everybody should applaud the fact that Ashiwaju, Bola Amit Tinubu has said, this is how we are going. If you disagree with that, opinion is free. Come up with reasonable, you know, uh, 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 um, um, pronouncements on how you think it could also have been done. Because at the end of the day, we are all involved. But let me ask you, the queues that have grown overnight, what can they be attributed to? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Panic buy? You know, if you, if, you, if you understand Nigeria, you know, uh, you will not be surprised uh, because of the fuel hike and, and what have you. In the past couple of years, you know, the dealers have been expecting a fuel increase. You know, in fact, at the end of every year. So you keep having all this artificial scarcity and what have you. Yes. It doesn't mean that all these decisions don't have fuel. They don't want to sell. They just lock it up, waiting for any announcement. Now that the president just said that uh, the subsidy will, will go, he has not removed it yet. Oh, uh, they're not selling. There, there is not, there, he has not removed the subsidy Are yet. they not selling? They're, Sorry. They may be selling, but yeah, go, yesterday was tedious for me. Go out there. You will yes. see queues, endless queues. Already, this was barely 24 hours after the announcement. But he has not even started doing that. I wonder why these people rushed into doing it. That you know, is the point. We, we, we cash in on every situation to make money. That's one dangerous thing that we do. The society does not like itself. People who make money, you know, when others are... Uh, uh, in a tight situation, that's what we get, especially when it comes to fuel. And of course, PMS has become the, the, the nucleus of our, not only the economy, but our daily operations. No, that, the moment you touch PMS, yes. people begin to think, in fact, if you go to buy ordinary Ugo vegetables or spinach, they will tell you that fuel is high. Therefore, I mean, you can get just one or two pieces for 100 naira mm -hmm. and so on. And that's how it has also, you know, uh, affected all other things that we do. Transportation, food, name it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, the man has not started, he has not started implementing uh, the, whatever he said. He said it's an idea to remove it. That's the best for us. We have also allowed the, the first of it to eat into our fabric. For over 50 years, you are practicing something that is not defensible. Even the management of it over time seemed to have become suspect. So the president, the, 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 the new, our new president, has a lot of looking in to do. Yeah, a lot of looking. A yeah. lot of it. Well, well gentlemen, uh, <laughs> I will uh, pause my comment on the fair subsidy issue and return to it presently. 
But I think that it's important to pay tribute to uh, High Chief Raymond Dokbesi, who passed away yesterday at the age of 71. Uh, Dokbesi was a trailblazer in uh, private broadcasting investment in this country. Following the deregulation of broadcasting in 1992, which until then, only federal or state governments could own broadcast stations, radio and television. The Pesci started Repower in September of 1994. And of course, AIT, which is the television uh, arm, then was joined. Uh, he has uh, blazed the trail, expanded his, his, uh, his, his network uh, in Nigeria, being an employer of labor. Uh, he, also is a poly he also was a politician. Uh, he was with, uh, I think, the People's Democratic Party, and at some point he sought their ticket to also become president. But it, it certainly uh, is somebody that the media industry will remember for his contribution to the growth of the industry. When Ray Power started in 1994, how many stations did we have in Nigeria? Today, Nigeria has 740 operational broadcast stations with 67 new licenses approved by the president just some months ago. So whether they have started operating, I wouldn't know. So we're in a situation, in a country where you have over 800 licensed stations, federal, state, institutional, community, private, uh, that tells you the growth, that there was a trailblazer, there was a pathfinder who saw opportunities there and then moved in. It started, of course, uh, at Alabado, and I remember listening to their first broadcast. Uh, that morning uh, in Lagos in, uh, in 1994. You heard Steve the Sleek? Uh, yeah, I know, Steve the Sleek. That is the menace? Yeah, uh, Steve the Sleek, I was a disc jockey, is late now. A uh, force are Steve the Sleek. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's gone. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you, you had, it, it was a challenge uh, to every other uh, broadcast station to sit up. Uh, before then, if you recall, it was OGBC. Uh, OGBC uh, Radio uh, was, uh, was, was, taking away viewers from the peripheral areas of, of, of Lagos. Uh, that's yes. yes, and then wherever you could get them, their sports program, uh, Larry Zamoje, yes. of course, who was going to Abekula to run their program, and Larry himself eventually invested in the radio station, which is called Brilla mm -hmm. FM. Mm -hmm. So the spin-off is, is there for everyone to appreciate. And may Chief uh, Dopez's uh, soul rest in peace. And our hearts go out uh, to his widow, who is our colleague, uh, Tosin uh, Dopezi, and all the staff and management and board, of course, of uh, uh, yeah. dark uh, communications, uh, which got listed on the stock exchange. And, uh, you know, the wonderful thing that he did, it was not just to establish the television station, but sustenance. I recall when they had issues, you know, legal issues and what have you, uh, when uh, perhaps those who were led money, bands, I, 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 you know, exactly, you know. And he, he, and, and he won the case at the point, you know, and they, all this stuff, you know, lifted him up. Did you, uh, right. did and, you not notice the goodwill uh, that and, people showed uh, when they said, do we begin to donate for you to keep on because, existing? Exactly. And again, recall that we also had menaged television of Bosi, which was not sustained. That to show you that uh, what Tesla was saying about his uh, doggedness, you know, in ensuring that he, he, he broke the jinx, you know, of, uh, of Monopoly then. You know, and came I want to thank Kingsley for saving that for last. Mm. I've worked in about seven, yeah, yeah, that's seven what I was TV thinking. stations. Mm. I've spent most of my time in AIT, dark communications. Mm. I left as head editorial. Mm. So, Kingsley, thank you so much. Thank you. The High Chief of uh, Wepawano, Wep it's not just a trailblazer. It was a shooting star. The man was a comet. We would sit at the meeting like this, and we'll, he would look at us. He, he did not hide the fact that there are a few, a few health, problem, health issues he was dealing with. He, he was that open. Mm. Then he would look at those of us who, were, who looked so healthy and all that, and feel that we were rather being little about the way we lived our lives. Mm. He pumped the can-do spirit in you. Mm. If you wanted to, tag along and have your name, you know, etched in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. High Chief Raymond Dokbesi was an enigma. Oh. I never quite got to understand him. I wasn't lucky to be close to him. But High Chief Raymond Dokbesi, any time anyone made a, made a comment about things not moving well in AIT, and I said, you are not looking at the opportunities he has laid on the ground. You are seeing the obstacles maybe your mind has created. 
see the opportunities he has laid on the ground and see how much you can help the effort. Gentlemen, it is a yeah. pass that mm. really needs to be noted in yeah. gold colors. All right. And yeah, uh, yeah. Well, before, uh, the, the other issue, uh, as I said, the fair subsidy, uh, if we have the time, I'll, I'll comment on it. There were some uh, oddities, if you, if you may, uh, from the inauguration ceremonies that also took place in 28 states uh, throughout the Federation, even here at the, at the Eagle Square. Uh, perhaps that, the one at Eagle Square will be one for uh, more detailed comment. But there were a few things that I felt either funny, but otherwise also very serious. A canoe, the uh, roof of the uh, pavilion where the governor and other dignitaries were present, that's to say the, uh, the governor-elect was being sworn in, the roof caved in. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened? And uh, I don't want to claim responsibility for that. And when the time came for the new governor to sit down and sign, uh, after subscribing to the oath of office and allegiance, he declared to use the chair uh, that his predecessor had previously used. So he used, he used another chair. So that tells you straight away you're going to have a running battle or a fierce relationship between the new uh, governor and then the, uh, the former governor. The other one uh, was in a state. I'm sure some persons would have seen that. The governor was reading his address, his inaugural address, a new governor, and he seemed unsure of himself. The protocol took almost forever. It was halting, and I, at some point I was asking myself, was he being distracted or otherwise? And you just see his composure. They didn't, seem, they didn't seem okay, and I wonder how much training he got before he came to the microphone. Uh, because some of our public officers just think that you have a microphone, you start speaking, people will listen to you. You have to have the art and the discipline of public speaking. I, to be honest with you, at some point I was embarrassed. I, I just thought perhaps he wasn't, maybe he, maybe he, he, he was too scared of his predecessor, who was an overbearing uh, per, uh, person anyway, now former governor. I, 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 didn't, I didn't find that funny at all. Kingsley, stagecraft does not respect class mm. if preparation has been absent from the process. You see, public speaking is being downplayed by us. When um, former British Prime Minister um, Tony Blair left, what was his main, uh, 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 his preoccupation? Public speaking. Mm -hmm. Our leaders, our mm -hmm. spokesmen, our community people and all that should give a very proper place to public speaking. John Mason, who wrote a book on public speaking, will tell you that <laughs> if you don't prepare, if you take public speaking as something that anybody can just handle, you're going to fail from the first step you put on the podium. Mm -hmm. Podium masters are not created overnight. Mm -hmm. Nigerian leaders, Nigerian spokesmen should learn that. Yeah, it was the stage fright, you know. I, mean, I think uh, he wasn't prepared. And again, when you are dealing with a script that you did, did not write, you know, you're dealing with a script that you, you did not produce, right? It, it, it's like that. We need a lot of rehearsals to be able to deliver that. Well, I'm sure that the speechwriter wrote it for him. We are taking too much time, so let me well, just say this. Uh, when you write, you see, when people read the news here, I'm not looking at just the newscast. I'm looking at the editor. Mm. Did he script something that could be told or talked? Mm. Or he scripted something that, that would be read? Mm. Um, Ike Nandaguba, the star of broadcasting, told a Cross River broadcaster when he, myself, and Big Boy Lloyd, they went to train them. You were reading and not telling or talking, so I missed the meaning. Mm. You have to learn to, to deliver. Talk. You're making newscasting difficult for newscasters because you're not scripting a talk. Mm. He's not going to become a yeah. magician when he sits there. That's what is called the deliberate delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in talking, you, you know, you. the talk sense into the script. You know, not just the or whatever. Well, that's yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's it. I would just hope that he learn. Mm. Yes. I, I don't. What happened? It, sometimes our protocol uh, procedures can be a bit embarrassing. Or oh, one of the governors who came for the inauguration at the Eagle Square it was obviously uh, denied access uh, to, if you may, the state box. And, and the video went viral. I you think it was... Uh, yeah, Ganduja yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, Soludo uh, and Ganduja. Well, Ganduja is former governor. Mm -hmm. Former governor. Exactly. And then Soludo is incumbent governor. Mm -hmm. Incumbent governor of... Uh, Anambra. Of, of Anambra. So I, 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 would, I, I would imagine, for instance, that your invitation card 
would show where you are supposed to uh, be That's seated. Right. Mm -hmm. and instead of facing that embarrassment, uh, a person is coming in, you guide the person almost immediately rather than the person getting to the entrance and then you keep pointing and say, no, this is not where you're supposed to be. And everyone, uh, t I, I, don't, I don't think, it didn't, it didn't seem tidy. Uh, yes. yes. I don't but, think it was but, tidy. But I, I have a different view o o o o on this, you know, you know mm. I, we attach so much importance on personalities that you are a governor and you came to a place, they say, oh, God, this is the right place for you. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Even though people were making it to go viral. So who are you? You are a governor. As a matter of fact, in other climes, governors queue up in bags. Governors queue up everywhere. Do you understand? I, I ate in the same restaurant with the, 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 the prime minister of Sweden, in a, in a Chinese restaurant, in, 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 in the capital city of uh, in Stockholm. He was just sitting there with two friends. They said he's the prime minister. We're looking at him as if it's not true. And he drove himself to the place. So we look at these people as if something is different. Like, oh, God, this, this is where you're supposed to go. You move there. Not, nothing wrong with that. You are being a governor. It does not matter. I just an, this, an ordinary human being like us. We don't know what huh? happened, but this whatever it is that was seen directing him, go this, there, go there, go there, and he was still staying and talking to the man. Disrespect, the man has told you where to go, and you are still standing and telling him to change his disrespect that, his mind. to protocol is <laughs> enough for some event handlers to tell you not to be exactly. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. That's it. That, that, the gentleman on the issue of fuel subsidy, I, I think that there has been an overreaction. The president at uh, his swearing in yesterday said fuel subsidy is gone. And I, I was saying to myself, what is the new thing that the president has said? Nothing. Because he made reference to the budget that is inherited. Oh, yes. We knew several months ago that the budget that was prepared for 2023 had a terminal date of June 2023 Thank you. for the payment of fuel subsidy. Thank you. That was part of what the president referred to in his inaugural address or in his statement to, the, to Nigerians yesterday. We also know that, and there were concerns about that, that the, the, uh, the former president sent to the National Assembly a request to borrow $800 million from the World Bank for the purposes of palliatives for the poorest of the poor as a result of the removal of subsidy from July this year. And people were saying, why, why, you are, you are borrowing to the last minute. So they said they will pay 5,000 naira, 5,000 to the poorest of the poor, to uh, absorb the shocks of the removal of your subsidy, which will be in July. We already knew these things. So if, the, uh, we, we, today is the 30th of May. Tomorrow is the last day of May. We enter June, we have only 30 days to go. Then from, from July, you, 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 you proceed. So what else is the new thing that the president has said that will trigger the kind of panic reactions that we are seeing? That's one. Second point, assuming the president was saying this for the first time and declaring that fuel subsidy is gone, I think that our policy mix ordinarily should take care of the whole hog. What are the ramifications of this announcement? We have seen fuel queues already, and it is not because those stations don't have fuel. Hoarding is going on. Where are your regulators? Because hoarding is an economic offense. Where are your regulators? Don't drive sense into these persons to say that what you are doing is wrong. Are you saying that because fuel subsidy, fuel subsidy has been removed, then it automatically amounts to fuel scarcity? Remember what happened? Or to, when, or to hoarding. When the DSS, so the presidency, them. felt that people were hoarding fuel. You remember? Yes. Any station that does not sell fuel within 48 hours will be shut down. You remember what happened immediately? Yes. Enforcement is key. And enforcement. That, 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 is, that is a very significant issue to also pursue. That is, that is one leg. The other leg is the rehabilitation of the other refineries that we have had. Uh, shifting dates, shifting dates, shifting dates. The president, of course, will be right to demand the completion date for those refineries. I let them be pumping fuel. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, I think we have to uh, conclude this. Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, we, we, for, for us to also uh, touch on other issues. Why I don't like to talk about uh, fuel and the uh, refinery is that uh, I am just tired of uh, talking about something that everybody should know. Uh, you know, I, I've not seen a nation that has a produce
that he goes to, you know, you, you know, you can't package, get tired. Package, package, so package, do package, you want us to give you turnaround maintenance? Package elsewhere <laughs> and come back here to sell the same products that you produce. So it's, uh, it's confusing. And uh, I don't know why it has become so difficult for, for a nation to sit down and say, look, we have to get things right. There are no big deal about getting our refineries back. I, I'm a novice in that profession, but I know that uh, the, the, one of the oldest refineries in Nigeria is that of Texas, the one in Texas. is still running up to today. All right, so what have they been doing? Have they been uh, you know, uh, uh, dismantling and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and installing new, new, new machinery? It's, it's a question of uh, you know, uh, doing some little rehabilitations and what have you. But the, the, the men that are there, are just there to make this nation. Each time money is taken to for is taken away for um, um, uh, 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 turnaround maintenance. I said I had nothing from 1990s. Turnaround maintenance. Then after which there will be fuel scarcity for a while. And after that, even when they return after the rehab rehabilitation or whatever maintenance they did, we still go back to the same thing. Four refineries, none is functioning to 50% capacity. So who are you going to tell that kind of story across the globe? Some nations don't even sell crude oil. They sell only refined oil. So you buy it, and you buy it at a higher price. And it's, it's so confusing. <coughs> and some people have fuel tanks, um, oil tanks, whatever they call it. You bring that, you go and store it there. Those people are doing their own business there, storing it Tank and farms. hoarding it and selling it at higher price to dealers. And dealers will come to the pump and now increase it. Go to Inugu now. If you don't buy fuel at 400 naira to this morning, then I'm not telling the truth. Go to the South Indian. That's how it's by now. It's 300 naira per liter. Go and check. Make a place a call. Uh, okay. Uh, Kira, I, I took with you. Now... Let's also take a look at the economic arguments. They say fuel subsidy is inefficient economics. Happily, both the president and the vice president are financial experts. The vice president, Kashim Shetima, was a former banker and a former two-time governor of Borno State. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about refineries not working. NNPC in its books of accounts states how much is spent in keeping those inefficient refineries the way they are. Paying the staff their emoluments, their allowances, their pension contribution, and so on and so forth. These amounts, according to one account, will run into billions of naira. So where is it, what do we do with that kind of inefficiency? That refineries are dead, and then you are spending so much just to, just, just to keep the staff or whoever it is in place. So these are the kind of questions that we would need to get answers to. And I've said on Good Morning Nigeria repeatedly, because we had a, an engineer from Kaduna with us, from Kaduna Polytechnic, the Nigerian Society of Engineers. They actually gave an award to the then uh, 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 managing director of Kaduna Refinery, Engineer Bola Ayodele, he has retired now. They fixed Kaduna Refinery using local engineers and also getting their spares from the workshop at Ajakuta. It was working. Until, of course, we hear the mafia, as they are all over the place. So if you are ready to deal with the mafia, deal with the mafia. Fear subsidy is the easiest thing to, to say we are removing it by June. We stop. No question about that. But all other related issues must also be dealt with because there are leakages in our economic system. Yeah, exactly. And all of these things, uh, they're, 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 they're linked up. Uh, so you cannot do one without the other to enable us to have a very efficient uh, uh, economic setting. Well, I, I don't really envy the president of Nigeria today, uh, Ahmed Balatinibu, because, of course, he has so many things to deal with. And uh, on that note, we call it a day on this uh, segment of the program, newspaper Review. I'd like to appreciate uh, Chukudi Obwaja, Okoli Obwaja. <laughs> Uh, for being here this morning and for making this segment uh, very exciting. Thanks for always giving me a bright <laughs> week. <day. laughs> Thank you that. so much. All right. And uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll be dealing with the inauguration speech by Nigeria's uh, 16th president in the person of uh, uh, Suwaju Bola Ahmed Tinbo. Your skill is key to your professional growth in the competitive broadcast media industry. Take advantage of the following programs specially packaged by NTA Television College Jaws to upgrade your skill. Computer General Application, date 8 May to 19th May 2023, two weeks. English Grammar and Pronunciation for Broadcasters, date 22nd May to 9th June 2023, three weeks. Basic Broadcast Accounting and Auditing, date 22nd May to 9th June 2023, three weeks. Marketing in the Era of Digital Broadcast, date 13th June to 23rd June 2023, two weeks. 
Drama Production Workshop. Date 3rd July to 21st July 2023. Three weeks. Intermediate Online News Reporting Skills. Date 24th July to 11th August 2023. Three weeks. The course fee for the two week course is 120,000 naira, while the fee for the three week course is 150,000 naira only. Accommodation inclusive. All courses will hold at NTA Television College near Old Government House, Rayfield, Jules. For further inquiries, please call 0803 079 53354 NTA Television College Jaws, training you to be the best you want to be. Registrar Announcer. The Council of Our Fathers. I will urge and advise our younger generation to use talent and brain to sort out problems, not uh, Arms. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. All right, and uh, you're still watching Good Morning Nigeria on a Tuesday, <coughs> watching you live on NTA Network Service. Now, as a prompt for our conversation this morning on President uh, Tinibu's inaugural address, we begin with a report. Uh, by our correspondent, Musbao Danwahab. In our midst, the president elect. A Monday morning auspiciously became the start of a new political dispensation in Nigeria. Nigeria's day in the sun after a wet morning. Millions of Nigerians within and outside the country, as well as global observers, looked on as Nigeria changed its leadership button. Within this arena, where representatives of the world here to be part of yet another significant moment in the history of the most populous African nation. So, some steps were needed to activate a new administration that promises hope. Nigeria's new VP, Kashim Shetima, and then its principal, and President Bola Tinubu pledged to defend the nation and always choose her over personal considerations. A tenure ended and another began with the lowering and hoisting of the national and military colors. And formations of the Nigerian armed forces added color to this event ushering in a new commander-in-chief. And then a moment to project hope President Bola Tinubu commended the efforts of his predecessor, former President Muhammad Buhari, for his leadership and guiding the values of democracy. Acknowledging the turbulent moments the country has endured in time past, the President assures all that Nigeria will remain one notwithstanding, promising a representative government that will engender fairness and equality. Our body may make us bend at times, but it shall never break us. Instead, we stand forth as Africa's most populous nation and as the best hope and strongest champion of the black race. President Tinobu reiterated his administration plans to defend the nation against any threat, develop agriculture, improve infrastructure and create job opportunities amidst urgent reforms that will remodel and grow the economy at a faster rate. We shall remodel our economy to bring our growth, achieve the GDP much better than we have today. I assure you, my administration must create meaningful opportunities for our youth. We shall honor our campaign commitment of one million jobs and the digital economy. All right, thank you very much, uh, Musba Udan Wahab, for that background. Uh, with us in the studios to discuss this, we'd like to welcome uh, a development economist Ayo Oyalowo. Uh, Ayo, we're glad to have you this morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. And joining us uh, from our Kaduna Network Center is uh, Dr. Saleh Momale. Dr. Saleh Momale, Executive Vice Chairman, Kaduna Peace Commission. Doc, we're glad to have you again on Good Morning Nigeria. Good 
Good morning, and very happy to be on the program, and good congratulations to all Nigerians. Uh, uh, thank you. We're just uh, hoping to have a, a, a clear audio, and that's exactly what we have. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the program. We're expecting other guests to also join us. Well, it's a, it's a new dawn, you know, I mean, a new era has just begun, and uh, we saw the, uh, uh, the, the, the coloration, you know, of uh, ceremony. Uh, yesterday, beautiful ceremony to usher in the 16th president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And after the ceremonies, of course, there came the speech, you know, that uh, Nigerians are reacting to at the moment. And that, that, was, that uh, prompted uh, our topic uh, for today, Good Morning Nigeria. Uh, well, we, we, we have you with us directly in the studio, are you or, or Yellow or a political development economist? Fine. How do you... Uh, see the, uh, the inaugural speech. What's your, what's your takeaway from what was delivered by the 16th president of Nigeria, Ahmed Balatinibu, oh. yesterday? Yeah, thank you. About seven takeaways that I noted here from his speech. And that is uh, one, the subsidy that is the biggest uh, talk. Then um, he talked about creation of job and prosperity, especially for our teaming youth population which for me, it's a, it's a great thing because I remember during the election and during the time we were wrapping up everything, I was here a few times and youth, youth keep popping up because they are very critical and they are a huge number in our society. So to make them a fulcrum of his inaugural speech is, 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 a, good, is a good thing. It shows uh, his thinking about them. It shows that the youth will definitely be the focus of his uh, administration. And then he talked about uh, the reform of security, doctrine, and architecture, uh, which everybody will be looking forward to, especially with our recent history, with uh, insecurity and other things that we've had. He also talked about gradually growing the GDP, which I, I also think is something to be looking forward to, especially if we want to maintain our dominance as Africa powerhouse and then begin to compete not just with Africa now, begin to go beyond the, the shores of Africa. Uh, he also, in his inaugural speech, another thing that you can take away is the creation of agricultural hub across the nation and uh, the board and all the stuff that uh, will be key in our agricultural development. We have seen the past administration that just left yesterday have done a lot in agriculture, but a lot still need to be done. So he made that uh, uh, a part of his uh, speech. And also the monetary policy which for me is almost neck to neck with the fuel subsidy. Uh, bringing together the exchange rate, especially where we would not have the dichotomy of uh, a huge difference between what the CBN is doing and what is done on the parallel market. So it's a good thing. It's a house cleaning as far as I'm concerned. And then the foreign policy objective for him, he says peace and stability. So that when you are stable, especially within our neighboring states and other countries around us, uh, we know some instability close to us will naturally affect us. So making it a, a, fo a, a focus of his administration is good. So those are the seven key takeaways that I, I saw in the speech that he gave yesterday. All right, uh, Ayo, thank you very much. We'll come back to you presently. Let's return to Dr. Uh, Mamale in Kaduna. Dr. Mamale, what uh, did you uh, glean from the president's inaugural address? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's actually one of the great high moments for the country, especially after the experiences during the election process, particularly the campaigns, the elections, and then Here's what I found. some of what we experienced during the immediate uh, post-election uh, petitions. We're very happy, and I think it is important that Nigeria has been able to achieve this, and we are all much more confident in the ability of the country and the current political dispensation. For me, one of the most important responsibilities of a leader is to inspire his own people, to inspire the citizens. So I think my first most important message from what President Bola Tinubu said yesterday 
was the assurances he gave Nigerians and the hope and aspirations that he has built in the minds of many citizens. Um, he first of all said, as far as he is concerned, political coloration no longer exists in his mind, and he sees every person in this country as a Nigerian. I think for me that is a very powerful message, and we hope that we will see this statement in practice in the discharge of governance. The second thing that is very important was the fact that he took Nigerians back to history lane, looking at and the turbulent challenges it has faced, and also for reminding us that every society faces such challenges. But we have pacified, and we are here of today. And he assures us that his administration will work to drive us further in the path of progress progressive development. For me, I think this is the second most important uh, aspect of the speech of Mr. President. And we do hope that we will continue to see this form of engagements between the top leadership of the country and the citizens, so that collectively we will be on the same path and we will all be inspired to make more positive contributions. Um, I think the earlier speaker have mentioned about some important takeaways. Uh, which are very key and important. And for us as a country, I think the first major thing is the economy, because this is what everybody looks up to. So his uh, economic policies that he highlighted, particularly like he mentioned, uh, managing uh, the exchange rate, managing the monetary policy, the uh, rate of inflation, and the challenges of unemployment are very key and critical to Nigerians. So for that, and the policies he put in place seems to be in the right direction. What we are looking for is to see the details of how this will work. The second aspect is energy. One of the major crises facing Nigeria is the energy crisis, both in terms of uh, fuel supply, in terms of electricity uh, generation and distribution. And I think this is key. He also highlighted those aspects and where he thinks his administration will tilt towards. The third most important aspect is security. We have seen how insecurity has devastated uh, thousands of communities across the country. And the challenges that even insecurity within our neighboring countries also poses to the country, which also leads up to the foreign policy perspective that he mentioned. So we are looking forward to seeing the types of reforms and initiatives that he will, take, uh, he will put in place in addressing the challenges of insecurity. And we do hope that it will be a massive engagement with so that we will see higher level of citizens' involvement, of vulnerable groups and communities across the country, and more robust security architecture where the security agencies becomes more friendly, more people-oriented, and responding to emergency needs of the various uh, communities that are experiencing threats of insecurity and violence. Agriculture is the mainstay of the Nigerian economy and the major source of livelihood for millions. And he mentioned both the crop and livestock sectors, and he mentioned the application of technology uh, which we do hope to see uh, a lot of investments in agriculture and livestock production that will address increase uh, productivity and livelihoods. Okay, well, th th thank you indeed. Uh, and uh, we are back to the studio once more. Um, Ayo Oyelowo, I think uh, it's incumbent on every uh, leader, especially a president of a nation to itemize all the sectors of the nation's national life, which of course he did yesterday. With respect to security, energy, power, these are these are daunting and endemic challenges in this country for decades now, which we know. But again, what has been the crux of the matter in the country with respect to uh, development has always been, uh, uh, you know, the, the art of implementation. We don't lack in uh, you know articulating blueprints, you know uh, whatever uh, like the uh, yesterday's uh, uh, you know speech delivered by the Mr. President, well articulated, quite on point, 
you know, and uh, it's geared towards addressing those issues that we've live, been live, living with for over the years. So it's not new to Nigerians. Now, how do, you, how do you think he intends to deal with the issue of fuel subsidy? Because he mentioned yesterday that it is gone. He has not started implementing it, and now the effect, it has, it has a ripple effect already. So how will he, because why I raise this point at this, at, the, at this time is that it is major, because anything on PMS affects other sectors of a national life. How would he go into that? Yes, speech well made. <coughs> how does he go into that? How, what is the possibility of getting it properly implemented as to carry Nigerians along? Well, uh, I may not be able to tell you the how because I am not in his mind. I am not in his cabinet. What would be the ideal thing to do? Because but, uh, aha, mm -hmm. now, uh, now the ideal thing to do now would be to sit down with the NNPC and then probably the Labour and fashion out ways because typically we talk about palliatives and palliatives and palliatives. But clearly, I think I was talking off the camera earlier saying I did a research on the uh, fuel subsidy thing and. I may not want to say everything here, but honestly, if, if we continue to keep that uh, subsidy regime, we are, we are being wicked to Nigerians. It's a, it's a huge scam, a very huge scam. The kind of shenanigans that go behind the scene is something that no reasonable government should keep. So I'm glad that he said he would take it out. Unfortunately, we decided to show ourselves again as Nigerians. The government has not started implementing it, but first marketers have started jacking up prices. Some have refused to sell, so we are seeing queues already. So I hope there will be a, a statement to diffuse this tension because I just saw NMPC this morning have made a statement. Maybe it was this morning or yesterday, but I read it this morning where the, the, MD, the MD said, look, there's no need for stress. They still have enough, uh, and they will still sell at the old price until the uh, plant is, uh, are put in place. So I, I think there is really... It's unfortunate that uh, marketers have decided to punish Nigerians overnight. It's not necessary, it's not worth it. Uh, whatever was going on, we still have to go on for a while until implementation is done. And then the ideal thing now would be to, one, uh, sit down with the labor, ensure that uh, you fashion out a plan where everything will be agreeable to them and to the government. And secondly, palliatives we keep talking about, but I, I think what we need to do now is to ensure that our, our public transportation system is better improved to uh, uh, convey the masses more. And um, many of us continue to use some cliché, even though we don't believe in them, which now we have to start believing. You hear many people tell you that uh, a good country, a developing country, a well-developed country is not the one where everybody has a car, but it's the one where the public transport system works for everyone. So if you now elect to use your car, it's good. If you elect to use the public transportation system, it will still serve you. So right now we need to buckle up on that aspect. And then fortunately also, the outgoing, I mean the outgoing government has done a lot in terms of rail and, and uh, road construction. I believe this administration must continue to build on <coughs> that. We must have infrastructure that will convey people. If you're able to do that, if we have rails that work, then there will be less uh, pressure on the roads, as it were. So, and then I, I also think maybe there may be some, some, some form of salary uh, increment for especially the civil servant who will, be, who will be at the brunt of this because uh, government should naturally have more money to do a few other things because they will be saving a lot from the, uh, the subsidy. subsidy that will be uh, terminated in the, in the course of the administration. So a lot of things will have to be done, but these are things that will have to be discussed. I believe the speech yesterday was just to give the direction, not to say start it, but unfortunately our marketers just love to make Nigerians uh, go through pains. I hope something is done to elevate this suffering and stop it because NNPC is making a statement right now and I hope everyone listens. But unfortunately, most times NMPC will tell you, oh, we have enough for three months, there should be, but people will not listen, they will still keep punishing Nigerians. So let's hope we're able to find that balance in, in order to uh, elevate the suffering of uh, the masses of Nigeria. Well, thank you, Ayo. I, I, I want to move to another uh, subject matter. We can always return to the no problem, uh, first subsidy issue. And my question is going to Dr. Saleh Mamale. 
Dr. Saleh Momale, uh, in the, if you may, uh, early paragraphs of uh, the President's inaugural address before he got into the workaday issues of security, jobs, agriculture, etc., it, it did say something uh, that he would uh, not consider himself as more patriotic than his opponents whom he defeated at the elections and that those opponents themselves are not any less patriotic, that he respects the fact that they have gone to court to seek redress, but that he will continue to respect them and, of course, uh, believe in them as true patriots and invited all those who didn't vote for him to also join hands uh, with a task ahead of running the country. You want 200 million persons or whatever, 90-something million persons who were eligible to vote or couldn't have possibly uh, voted for him. What, what signaling, in your opinion, is inherent in that? Uh, to say, look, uh, are we, we should be getting away from perpetual electionary and get going with the business of governance. That is uh, quite inspiring, as I earlier said. Because in democracy, people have right of choice. And based on the Constitution, the candidate with the highest number of votes emerge the winner. And by the provisions of the Constitution, once you are declared a winner, you are no longer just a leader of your own political party, but a leader of the constituency, and in this case, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So we really appreciate the president, and we thank him for making those statements, reassuring imminent Nigerians that contributed so much to the success of democracy, who have led this country at different capacities, and who have also contributed as the current president has done in the past at various levels of governance. And I think this is very important. We do hope that once, even now that the judicial processes are going on, we do hope that all the other candidates, and I think Mr. President also mentioned that those candidates have mass following, mass supporters, from other parts of the country who also need to come on board into the affairs of the governance of this country. So we therefore hope that even as these judicial processes are ongoing, the candidates of the other political parties who are in the tribunals will also join. And I think, like what we saw President Omar Musa Yaradua did by bringing in the other political parties into the affairs of government will help to strengthen the statements made by the president. If you will be able to bring on board, to reach out behind the scenes to all of these political leaders across the divides, bring them together to a common table, set up maybe an interparty uh, framework for regular consultations between the executives the legislature and the leadership of the political parties across all parts of the country will be very helpful in actualizing these very good statements that Mr. President have said. And with that, we hope to see more inclusive, more robust partnership and participation and more effective governance. And this will help us to address some of the sub-regional grievances that we are seeing in different parts of the country and will help heal all of these political wounds. We do know, for example, there are a lot of issues on the social media with a lot of uh, youths who are still insisting that their own candidates should be the leaders of this country. So by bringing the leadership of all of this together, bringing all of these youths, we hope to see a more united Nigeria where we will address most of the regional and sub-regional grievances that we are seeing, and we will have a more coherent, more inclusive government that will meet the aspirations of Nigerians.
Well, well said, you know, uh, uh, tell him. And uh, I, I like to make reference to what you just said, yeah, and that has to do with the, the sub regional grievances uh, which you mentioned. Very, very critical, you know, because uh, we are now talking about healing. You now want him to, you know, extend the hands of fellowship to other members of the political, uh, you know, uh, 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 landscape who participated in the election, some of whom are already in the tribunal. But let's just uh, call it spade a spade. If you, you are expecting those in the tribunal to come and join, I'm not sure that's going to happen. But what's more important from what you've said is the fact that he needs to really, you know, uh, ensure uh, inclusivity in what he's uh, planning to do, which is uh, good. Now, on this issue of uh, grievances being laid, let's, let's have, uh, note this fact. That what happened in about uh, two or three days ago by a group of persons who went and seized a radio station to begin to make some announcements and, and all of that is not just a joke. Because for them to have the courage, the temerity to do what they did, it means really there is grievance and it's not just them and it's, it's, it's all over the country so that's a very good point um if he wants to lead us without uh, having all this rancor uh from uh, ethnic groupings that's number one then what i'd like you gentlemen to really look at is this we know ourselves as nigeria as nigerians and we understand just like what you said um are you or, or yellow or what uh, the marketers are doing with respect to uh, uh fuel subsidy i am Hinging my question on this because, you know, if if fuel scarcity starts, then everything everything you know gets messed up along the line. That is what happened. Education, agriculture, name it, will be affected. Even energy and, and and so on. So I'm so concerned about what could be done to change the narrative, to turn around, you know, what we have experienced over the years. Because he said he's going to do things differently which means if there are things the previous administration failed to do, that he was going to incorporate it and ensure that uh, there are no lapses in that area. Now, what are those critical moves, apart from the issue of extending the hands of fellowship to others who ran the election with him, do within his cabinet and of all the parties that is in power? You know, first, we usually have internal crisis. Like now we're talking about who's going to be the uh, speaker, House of Reps, who's going to be uh, the, the Senate president and all of you. That one is another political, political scene of his own. I've already seen some things be, 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 you know, playing out that could affect governance, you know, in all essence. So now what steps, apart from this issue of extending hand of leadership, should he take to see how we can bring governance to the people so people will begin to feel not with this, what happened yesterday, yesterday, I'm doing yesterday today, when people are already hiking fuel prices, what can he do to douse the tension? Well, uh, I remember in one of his speeches, he said something, and that, has, uh, that rang a bell with me, and it has stayed with me since he said he's going to form a government of national competence. And if I know the meaning of competence, I think that means he will put the round pegs in round holes. And when he said national, which means it will be all over the country. Because if we're talking about healing, this is what you are saying. It means we must look around all the corners of the country, look for competent hands, people who knows their onions to be able to deliver governance like you rightly posited. Because yes, electioneering are over, politicking is over, it's time to face the business of governance. And if he says he will do that, I expect that to be done. And we've also had the, 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 the cliche, which I believe in, 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 um, in, in this administration should not just be a cliche, should be the right thing to do, said it will hit the ground running, which means there will be no time for dilly-dallying. We know the former administration took some time to uh, make some decisions that were critical. I believe within the next couple of weeks we should be having ministers of course you can't have them now because the national assembly has not been constituted you will need to send that letter to the incoming senate president which we don't have yet i think the senate will be constituted on the 13th of june so i believe as soon as we are in june the, after the, the law doesn't prevent him from sending the list to the, the uh, old yeah, one yes well i don't know that i know the law i actually <laughs> thought it has to be the, no unless unless they cannot finish the confirmation well, yes, before the expiration of well, the Well, with the political going on now, I don't <laughs> think they will finish that now. <laughs> because he also alluded to that fact of uh, the uh, internal, I want to be the speaker, I want to be here, yeah, we know those. So, so I'm not sure those people have the time to 
to <laughs> sit down anything. and screen anybody. <laughs> so right now, we need to just focus on the incoming mm -hmm. Senate. So for me, I, I think those are the critical things that needs to be done now, ensure that you have a cabinet in place immediately as soon as uh, it is uh, feasible to do that. You also have your key, what you call the kitchen cabinet, in place. Even though Nigerians have tried to call it cabal, which I don't think, I don't know where we got that word from, but every government, government should have a kitchen cabinet. You have those are your inner trustworthy people that you trust that you, you will take advice from. So you should have that in place maybe, with, maybe today, within the, this week, because those ones are also critical. They are part of the brain that you will need to, as a sounding board. So those are the things you need to bring that governance to everyone and ensure that each component of the society is touched. When I say component, I am talking about all the ethnic areas that you'll be looking at, the regional areas, then you're looking at all the religious areas because we cannot even divorce that from our reality. You have to touch that and then you have to touch other areas. I mean, we have experts in everywhere. You know, Nigerians are experts. If we are playing football today, we have 200 million coaches sitting down in their room and telling the original coach what you should have done there. So we must get all those people on board, get their ideas. And I also want to see more of um, an engaging government. When I say engaging, I mean we have national dialogue on critical issues so that we can have our minds in one place. I mean, when you have more broad-based national dialogue on issues, when decisions are arrived at, it makes people realize that, look, we have an input into this. So there's always going to be less rancor when there are national dialogue on critical. When I say critical, I'm not saying every decision because there's a decision that must be taken without having to waste time. But there are also some decisions that should be taken that we will have national dialogue on. We've had all these et ethnic agitations, so we need to sit down. Will there really be a situation to have a referendum for people who think they want to leave or not? If people really want to leave, can they get the numbers? Are they, are they serious about living or is just a threat to maybe get some kind of patronage? So those are the things we need to sit down and talk about because we cannot continue to put this under the carpet and pretend it's not happening. We know it is happening. We know some people are in jail now for uh, what you call maybe terrorism or whatever, but these people started as ethnic agitators. So all these issues must be discussed so that we will have a focus and then the government can now be able to face serious business and governance without having to keep dealing with these issues of uh, ethnic agitation and all sorts and all sorts. So those are the things for me that I think are critical that should be looked at. And I hope someone, someone is listening and I hope these things are taken on board. All right, Ayo, thank you very much. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I wanted to stay with you, but let, let me return to uh, Dr. You can Salem, come back later, Dr. <laughs> Salem Omale, and I'll return to you. In the lead up to the inauguration, there was the uh, lecture that uh, took place on Saturday, and the former Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta, they draw attention to the fact that the president-elect, when he becomes president, will be a father to all. And therefore, he should be accommodating of all sections. And indeed, also, uh, at that same lecture, uh, there were comments and statements made by other uh, Nigerian uh, dignitaries, including the Sultan of Sokoto and uh, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. Bishop Kuka did say that all is not well with Nigeria. What, in your opinion, is needed for us to begin this true healing process, without which we will continue to hear of the distractions, continue to hear of all the stories of murder and, and, and dissension and, and, and the tendencies that are tearing the country apart? What is the healing process that we need to embark upon? I'm asking this question deliberately because I know that you've been involved with uh, peace building efforts in Kaduna State. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please just permit me just to make a quick statement before responding to this, just as a build up to the earlier uh, discussion. I think if there is any takeaway that President Bola Tinobu should take from his inaugural speech is the implications of policy statements. Just 
by saying that fuel subsidy is over, the next hour, people are already reacting to that policy statement. So I do hope that he will take a very big lesson from this, that before governments make policy statements, before top political leaders say anything, they have to weigh the consequences at all levels. What have I put in place as a deterrence mechanism to some of these actions, for example? What short term, medium and long term strategy have I put in place before even coming out? What level of engagements have I met with all the key and critical stakeholders, first of all, before making any of such statements? I think this is very important, and this is part of those things that have driven many of these social upheavals and, you know, uh, misconstrued perceptions and perspectives that we are seeing in the country. So I do hope that this administration will take the issue of public relations, the issue of communication, the issue of media, very, very, very important. I do hope that Mr. President will have critical think tanks, important and critical expert working groups that will be looking at all of these critical sectors, looking at what policy direction they will take, put in place all the relevant mechanisms in, in, in place, make all the level of consultations needed before Mr. President make any public statement relating to any aspect of the governance of this, in this country. Um, coming back to the issue you just mentioned, all is not wealth with Nigeria is a very worthy statement. Certainly, there are a lot of grievances. Certainly, there are various perspectives, various views, divergent opinions on many aspects of national life. And I think this is not well with any nation, with any entity that want to see itself moving towards the path of progress. So I do think it was in this perspective that Father Kuka was saying that not all is well with Nigeria. For me, what I see is not well with Nigeria is that we collectively as Nigerians do not have a common national vision. We do not have a common feeling of this is where we are heading to and this is where we want our country to head to in the next one year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 50 years. So we hope that this administration will be able to put in place those framework that will be able to bring Nigerians together over time to come collectively and say, this is the direction we want. Like uh, Ayo just mentioned, we need to see every Nigerian seeing the country as one indivisible entity, every Nigerian seeing this country as one that should respect the provisions of the Constitution, every Nigerian that is saying that the ideals and the laws of the land are supreme to any other view or perception held by any other uh, individual, sub, uh, subnational unit, or organization, or whatever it is. So these are very important. The second thing I think is that there is a lot of polarization and radicalization along either ethnic, religious, or political divides. And I think we saw this even during the, the, the campaigns and during the elections, where the sort of statements we see from opposing political uh, parties and even high-level political leaders was quite unsavory. So we do hope that we will together come as a country, have the dialogues I just mentioned. Um, I am about to what is called kitchen cabinet. I am more uh, inclined towards the Federal Executive Council, the National Council of States, another council of traditional and religious leaders coming together to form broad national governance system that will be satisfactory to all Nigerians, that will be able to guide Mr. President, and that will be able to speak to the sub-national units, the governments at the state level, the governments at the local government level, all of us collectively with our diverse uh, religious organizations, with our diverse traditional institutions, and with the robust civil society groups, all heading in the same direction, all of us having similar perspectives, our professional unions, our professional bodies, the Nigerian Labor Congress, the association, 
the academic staff uh, unions, uh, the trade union congress, all of us together, collectively as a nation, heading towards one direction. And we are saying that these are the key policies we are driving in agriculture, in energy, uh, in, in industrial growth and development, in governance, in the management of our economy. Once we have this, I think we will be able gradually to deal with the various radicalization along ethnic, religious, and political divides that we are increasingly seeing in this country. Yeah, Dr. Momale, I'm going to stay with you. Um, you, you are the uh, vice chairman of a, a peace committee in Kaduna State. And Kaduna, as you know it, you know, is one of the states you know, where we have uh, certain disturbances based on the crisis here and there. Uh, some, of, some have even lasted over 10 years and it's still, it's still running and what have you. But again, I, we know that you have also made a uh, critical efforts to see how peace can return to Kaduna. Let, let me take it further. You said something concerning common national vision. I recall the MPN of those days, the National Party of Nigeria, to, uh, you know, they had this slogan, one nation, one destiny. Right. And, you know, in such a way you don't have peace, you have grievances, people agitating. Even you need to go to the streets, really, to feel the pulse of Nigerians. All right, to say, look, where are we going? Some don't, don't, don't even believe we have a government. Some don't even want to listen to news anymore because, because they believe that government is a deceit, you know, in terms of what we've experienced over the years. All right. So I want you to come in from this direction, the direction of uh, healing wounds, which you mentioned. You mentioned the world strata of uh, society that could, bring, could, could be brought together to discuss. We had 2014 National Conference in which President Jonathan assembled the best brains in this country from all <coughs> sectors of our national life, from all walks of life that assembled men and women of valor, of intelligence. They gathered and produced a document. That document is for the future of Nigeria and not for the future of any, any, any ethnic group. Can that document be revisited? Instead of all these issues of calling people together all over again, we have done that before, but we've not been able to implement what has been articulated in that document. And yet we are looking for a way to have peace, when of course solutions have been proffered in that document. Should it be revisited by this administration to see how it can begin to do things differently? Um, thank you very much. I, in fact, what I'm advocating is not a big national conference. What we are saying is not to hold or convene uh, big meetings. What we are saying is engagements at the appropriate levels. For example, uh, take for example, like you rightly said here in Kaduna State, there are a lot of grievances, there are a lot of issues, and there are a lot of challenges um, uh, within the subunits, various local governments, various uh, traditional council areas that are facing a lot of these challenges. So what we are saying is not that we are going to come to Kaduna City, convene a big conference. That's important, for example. But we have to have an engagement strategy that will deal with each issue at its own level. For example, uh, if there are disturbances, if there are issues and challenges within a particular section of the country. We need to engage the stakeholders at that level. Bring them on board. Engage them at the national level. Listen to all the, appro the grievances that exist and put in place those mechanisms that will address that. Of course, reference to important documents like the various uh, reports that we have from the various think tanks, uh, conferences and visions that we have held are very useful. But importantly, is what we are doing at the subnational level. For example, if you take the issue of uh, IPOP, for example, what strategy should this administration put in place? If you will speak about radicalization by Islamist groups, for example, within the Northwest, within the North Central, within the Northeast of Nigeria, what strategy are we going to put in place? Who are we going to engage? These are the kind of think tanks that we are speaking with, which are networked right from the grassroots level up to the national level. I think this administration should not be scared of investing in peace building. It should not be scared in investing in engagement with the public. It should not be scared of putting resources into those intangible, like uh, the political people will say, intangible engagements. What is happening in Benue? What is happening in Plateau? 
How do we bring these communities? What is happening in the southern parts of Kaduna? How do we link up the security institutions, the traditional rulers, the political leadership in those local communities to come together to work out with the Kaduna state governments, with the respective local governments, with the active participation of the national government because they are in control of the military, the police, and, and other apparatus of the national security. How do we come in place and form a formidable framework for addressing all of these grassroots challenges, whether they are over land, whether they are over grazing, whether they are over, uh, over chieftaincy issues, or even whether they are over agitations, uh, political agitations. This is what is important, and I think this administration need to invest, need to have the framework to deal with these issues, not necessarily at that level, but at the sub, uh, national level. Uh, level where these challenges exist. So we expect to see working strategies, working groups dealing with these challenges, directly interfacing with Mr. President, whereas may be required from time to time. All right, uh, Dr. Basale Momale, thank you very much there for your intervention one more time. Ayo, uh, here with us in the studios, we're going to take a short break now. When we return, we'll get on with another guest. Uh, to be part of the conversation that uh, they will be on the home stretch. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria on NTA's network service. Your skill is key to your professional growth in the competitive broadcast media industry. Take advantage of the following programs specially packaged by NTA Television College Jaws to upgrade your skill. Computer General Application Date 8 May to 19 May 2023 Two weeks English Grammar and Pronunciation for Broadcasters Date 22 May to 9 June 2023 Three weeks Basic Broadcast Accounting and Auditing Date 22 May to 9 June 2023 Three weeks Marketing in the Era of Digital Broadcast Date 13 June to 23 June 2023 Two weeks Drama Production Workshop Date 3 July to 21 July 2023 Three weeks Intermediate Online News Reporting Skills Date 24 July to 11 August 2023, three weeks. The course fee for the two week course is 120,000 naira, while the fee for the three week course is 150,000 naira only. Accommodation inclusive. All courses will hold at NTA Television College near Old Government House, Rayfield, Jaws. For further inquiries, please call 0803 079 5335 or 0806 980 9807. NTA Television College, Jaws. Training you to be the best you want to be. Registrar announcer. The Council of Our Fathers. My advice to these young people is please uh, do not take us back to those harrowing days. You probably do not know what it is. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. All right, you're welcome back, and it's still Good Morning Nigeria on NTS Network Service. We're being joined now by uh, Professor Edi Eragbe. Professor Edi Eragbe is joining us from our Benin Network Center. He's a professor of history and international studies at the University of uh, Benin, also a former dean of the Faculty of Arts and a former orator of the university. Uh, it's been a while since we had you on uh, Good Morning Nigeria, uh, Professor and incidentally, you were also a member of the National Conference in, in 2014, to which my colleague Kirian referred in his last question to uh, Dr. Saleh Momale from uh, our Kaduna Network Studios. But since we're getting you on now for today's conversation, let, let's have your first speech on uh, the President's inaugural address uh, yesterday. What for you were the significant points? Uh, in that address. Uh, good morning, uh, Osadolo. It's really my pleasure to be with you again. Although I've not been with you on uh, Good Morning Nigeria, I've had the opportunity of uh, being part of your programs during the elections and uh, not too long ago, uh, some other programs here. Uh, to the main point you raised, um, I listened uh, very attentively yesterday uh, to Mr. President during his inauguration. And uh, taking it uh, as a document of presentation to the nation, or his first major official uh, engagement with the country, I would say that yes, uh, he captured in that uh, speech uh, some of the great uh, worries that uh, patriotic Nigerians 
I'm sure I've been feeling bad about. Uh, what are, were these major issues? First, uh, I could uh, hear from his speeches today a commitment to the building of Nigeria. Uh, drawing from history, the origins of our country, the challenges we have faced, and then concluding on what I would call a very optimistic note that uh, being a people that have continued to overcome, that under its leadership, Nigeria is definitely going to work to become the great nation that the founding fathers of this country actually have expected and which indeed Africans have been expecting of our country. That was a major issue, and I think he was also uh, able to articulate the fact that, uh, yes, the elections have come and gone, but he's aware, as a patriot, also one that believes in democracy, the rule of law, that there are yet issues that have not been uh, concluded as far as the elections are concerned. And he made the point there that he concedes to his uh, fellow contenders or those that... Uh, also ran for the position that they have done the right thing to challenge if there are issues, and he believes in the rule of law, that at the end of the day, uh, the courts and all will have the final say on this matter, because that, of course, uh, is the, all, the right way to go when you don't accept maybe verdicts like the ones that were pronounced by the electoral umpire, INEC. Uh, the president yesterday also, from what I could uh, listen to or hear from him, uh, was calling on all Nigerians and reassuring them that it is going to be for all this time around. And uh, maybe uh, he would have had to rephrase uh, the uh, submission of the former president. But in his own, I think I captured that moment where he said, all he can see are all of us are Nigerians. And which would mean, and we hope, that that is really going to guide his uh, leadership as he tried to put it uh, in the years ahead. And then, the critical issues that are facing the country right now, the question of security. And then he talked about uh, the issue of employment, uh, which, of course, is part of uh, the economy. The programs and plans he has, in general terms this time, how he will try to, through, by way of uh, making sure security is in place, encourage investors, that is FDIs, for indirect invest investments, where he will make sure that uh, policies that uh, by way of taxation that have made it that the, those investors have been having doubts about the country, he will address multiple taxation issues. He will also, from what he was saying yesterday, address the uh, questions of unemployment by making jobs, that show that jobs are created. Uh, but sir, uh, my great listeners and of course uh, the anchor persons, uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. President uh, took uh, a very, what I would call, a bold step to uh, talk about the issue of uh, subsidy, uh, which uh, for us as Nigerians has remained over the years a very challenging and topical issue. And uh, right now, uh, the re vibrations, more than anything else that Mr. President said yesterday, I can tell you right here in Benin, that even before he finished, and uh, I'm sure he left Eagle Square, uh, Nigerians, in the, uh, those selling fuel and others, were already reacting. And as I speak to you this morning, uh, more than anything that Mr. President said yesterday, the one that is already revibrating, affecting homes, affecting individuals, affecting businesses, as far as movements are concerned, is the issue of the, uh, that is the removal of subsidy. Uh, that, I believe, is a challenge, and uh, we are hoping that uh, within a very short time, uh, the, that issue should be properly addressed. And what I mean uh, properly addressed, comprehensively, uh, to the extent that where are we really going? Because the had gone administration now, on the twilight, uh, was saying, okay, we are going to get uh, about $800 million uh, so that this could come by way of palliatives, we are just uh, last week here talking about the uh, issue of the refineries uh, being uh, the Dangote refineries coming on stream, and uh, which by July uh, there is supposed to be more local production. We have been waiting after heavy investments uh, in terms of the turnaround uh, maintenance of our refineries. What are all these? And I think those things will definitely 
in a holistic way would have led Mr. President, and I'm saying now, uh, those that will be there to advise, those that will be there to formulate policies, a full uh, holistic policy statement should be made. Not the type now that has sent uh, panic on the sides of Nigerians and people don't really know where to go. Because even when you say now what is supposed to be the prize, because even in the most civilized climes or most advanced economies, there is issue of regulation at all. Otherwise, it cannot be a free market. And so for me, as I have said, uh, I believe I saw yesterday Mr. President making commitment. He is there saying, I know these challenges. I'm ready to go with them, calling on Nigerians to all be part of it, believing that the task of nation building is not one of an individual alone, but a collective thing that we all should be involved in. And one interesting point I took away yesterday was where Mr. President was saying they more or less going to uh, lead, not going to rule over the people. Now let's hope that that will actually be a part of the hallmarks of his administration, where there will be effective engagement with the peoples of Nigeria. Because by the Constitution that Mr. President swore to yesterday, he is there, he has the mandate of the people to listen to the people, to lead the people, but not to be doling out uh, policies and things that maybe the people are not in tune with. And then, listening to my colleague that you spoke to earlier on about the peace-building effort, I think that is one major issue that the country, under this leadership, must address seriously. As you mentioned, I was privileged to have been at the 2014... Okay, well, well I, 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 I am not, uh, I, I'm not cutting you short, uh, uh, Professor... Uh, Professor uh, Rabwe, Professor Rabwe, I, I, I hope you can you can hear me now. I, I know you are. You are, I interrupted you. I, I'm sorry about that, but it's going to be very temporal because I'm still staying with you. Um, you know, thanks for being oratorial and of course uh, uh, being historical in, in all of this. And uh, the, the, where you are going is where I really want you to go. I, I'm sure you are trying to mention the fact that you were part of the uh, you know, to, um, 2014 National Conference, which of course addressed, if I understand that document, it addressed all aspects of Nigerian matters comprehensively, as you, as you, as you, and let me use your word. And in that document, everything was taken care of. Personalities like you, Brains like you were there, and everything was articulated. But I keep wondering, is that document not necessary at this point in time that we're talking about a, a new Nigeria? I need to bring in something new that has been articulated by, by brains in this country. For us to see how we can start from there. Because this issue of meeting groupings and all of that is, 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 uh, is uh, servicing some groupings, you know, who are in different ethnic groups of this country. But that one was holistic. Can it be revisited by this administration? to make a change felt by Nigerians. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, part of our great worry, as you are rightly captured, has been that after that uh, gathering, where with all humility we would say that uh, great segments of the country were effectively represented, uh, the academia, the various uh, groups at that time representing ethnic groups were there. Uh, the youths were there. And I remember that uh, the lady that said the closing prayers at that conference was about 21 years old, which would mean that virtually all segments were represented. And like you rightly mentioned, the 20 committees uh, that uh, looked at different aspects of the national question virtually took so many of the issues. But one of the most unfortunate things that happened as far as uh, that conference was concerned for me, was that even without looking at the recommendations of that conference, the outgoing Mr. President uh, took that position that he, he considered it to have been a waste of time or resources, and to that extent, he almost he made it public that he was not going to have anything to do with that document. But one of the historical realities that we have faced in the months and, uh, that have passed and the years that have passed is that the National Assembly, those, like I've been saying, are saying, please, go to that document. Go and look at what and what were said. This issue, for example, just give you a small one, headers, farmers, conflict issue. It was decisively talked about here. The devolution of power. And yesterday, for example, Mr. President made a statement which is consistent with one of the recommendations of that conference, 
which are to do with the issue of electricity, for example, power generation and distribution about the exclusive list component of it. Not too long ago, there were those that were saying state governments are not have no business in terms of generating um, electricity and getting involved in distribution. But we now know, and the president is saying, that that is one way they have to go. So like you are mentioning, uh, the recommendations of that company, I don't see where a nation will be shying away from information and uh, advice. Is that if, if, if Mr. President, I will recommend at this stage, if you can put up a, any time you do a conference or you set up committees, there are white papers that normally come. And what are those white papers? People will now look at what has been recommended, see what is practicable, see what you can adopt, see what you can leave behind, see what you can modify. I don't see why that should be a problem. And so for the, our president as is incoming, a versatile uh, in the, um, uh, Mr. President, a man that has been in governance for a long time, someone that has been exposed to policy making and all of that, I am hoping that he will have to tap from all available resources, including the very humongous and big documents, 670 pages with recommendations that came from that national comfort. Because as you have rightly mentioned, whether it's a question of education, the question of religion, the question of unity of this country, many of these issues have been raised. I give you for an example which most Nigerians have not been talking about. One issue that came up in this last election had to do about the question of how do you build the confidence of Nigerians in terms of power, about whether you should make sure that no sector is left out, no part of the country is left out. It was along that line, for example, that we're calling for a constitutional provision, constitutional, not parties now, that on the issues of power, there should be rotation. And that will mean that going by the north and south divide in this country, which is a reality, it should not be that one section we keep on to the presidency in perpetuity, but that you should build the confidence of all, knowing that they all have chances. And that is why it was being recommended that the, these rotations should be even at the state level, so that senatorially, you will say that they, when this uh, uh, senatorial district has taken it, we now know that the contestants are coming from the other side next time. These things we said, because as we speak today, my dear listeners, and of course, great moderators, are you aware that the issue of these zones, that we, all, we always talk of the political zones, oh, you are talking of south-south, not uh, that is uh, the northeast and all of that those things are not in our constitution we said they should be put there so that you now know that this is the turn of any group so that no group feels marginalized and then we talk of this devolution of powers one major issue the confab had to talk about had to do with this security which as we speak today there seems to be some modeling up in it and that is that there is a recognition that security at local levels there must be major input at the local level. Not that with due respect to the Inspector General of Police, who sits in Abuja, for example, then he's taking decisions about the creeks of uh, worry and all of that without being close enough to know exactly what is going on there. It was along that line that the issue of state police was being recommended. But what do we find? Consistently, we hear that, oh, if you have state police, the governors will abuse it and all. But is it not that there is a national police for example, but we are seeing that today, groups like Omotekun, different groups, because as we were speaking during the 2014 conference, we were having in the newspapers some local groups that were operating in North at that time addressing security issues. Why can't we be bold enough to put policies in place that we recognize that the security architecture of this nation needs to be revisited? These things, as I am saying, they are in that document. We really, really. Professor. Professor Aragbe, yeah, I, I would like stop. to pause you. you can stop. I'd like to pause you in the meantime. Uh, and just to bring in uh, Ayo uh, once again. Well, Ayo, the issues around healing have been touched on by the other two guests. I, I'm just saying uh, for the uh, new government, because in part of his address yesterday, the president did say that these were just outlines and that the fuller flesh uh, will emerge in the days to come. We, so, we sometimes have a habit in our country of uh, seeking to reinvent the wheel. Now, if the recommendations 
of the 2014 National Conference were a missed opportunity by the previous administration because they claimed then in 2014 and up to 2015 that it wasn't part of the agenda and therefore they were, they were not going to touch it. Uh, even though later, some years later, they did say that oh, some of the recommendations therein had formed part of their policy framework and part of the laws that had been made and part of the constitutional amendments that, that we were having. What would be your suggestions uh, with regard to pre-existing documents, pre-existing reports, pre-existing findings from which a government like this, because you, earlier I know you were talking about cabal and, and kitchen cabinet, but more appropriately you use kitchen cabinet, that ordinarily should be the work, like, like its own think tank, to say, look, this is what, this is what we are distilling, even though, we must admit, because we were one of our guests on Good Morning Nigeria ahead of the elections, his blueprint already has a number of these items uh, taken care of, but there are also overarching uh, 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 policy documents that, as it were, are in abeyance. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Yeah, I, like you said, I believe that um, you should have um, a think tank that helps to analyze these things. We have a lot of documents in Nigeria. We, you know, we, the last administration, we talked about the Orosan document, talked about it, talked about it, and eventually nothing came out of it. So, in the end, we're still yes. creating commissions. Although what happened is um, for, for some of these things, I think we've had uh, some aspect of them being touched about because I remember the, final, the former president that left yesterday signed uh, into law. Suddenly now, we now state can now begin to generate their own power which was not there before. So, so maybe what we need to do is look at all these documents and pick those areas that we think is good enough for us. Have a think tank that will sit down and actually help to articulate, okay, from this we can use this. From this we can say, it now forms a body of document that this will now be the, the policy trust of the administration. Yes, he, he already has his own plans. His um, blueprint was rich, but you can always, like I said in another place sometimes, you can always add to it based on existing issues that, that comes up or that keep coming up. You can up. read the book written you by can. your enemy. Yeah, of course, you can. You can. So the, 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 for me, we need to look at all these documents, sit down and actually generate one white paper on all of them, and then let's make it what we can implement, and then everybody can move forward. So that the governance can now move forward without us having to do this brick bat. We've had too many brick bats as a country. That's the reality. We've had too many brick bats. But we need to really move forward because there are a lot of issues going on in the world. We're having, now we, we, we are talking about uh, fuel and all this stuff, but we're having massive, if you're following economic trend, we're having massive economic shakedown in the world as we speak. Mm -hmm. There are alignment and realignment, there are new power blocks emerging. So we need to be a part of what is going on. If you get left behind, you will remain a third world country forever. Yeah. So we must key in to the reality of the world. So we have to find a way of removing all these small, small, small issues that are bothering us, mm -hmm. find a way to, fo to focus on, on them, fix the ones that can be fixed, and then let us sit down to become what we need to be as a country because you're having BRICS, you're having this, you're having Russia and uh, China realigning, you're having America trying to struggle to remain where it is. So we as a country, we are, number, we are the, the, the number you know, in Africa. So we have to ensure that we maintain that uh, position, but we shouldn't remain African giant alone. Mm -hmm. We must become a global giant. Okay. And you can't become a global giant when you keep dealing with a uh, small, small fire every day. You are quenching small, small fires here and there. So we need to leave those small, small fires, okay. wipe it away, and then Time, face uh, uh, global uh, domination. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you indeed, uh, 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 Yellow. And the time is not on our side presently. Um, let me bring in uh, Dr. Osala Momale once more, just uh, briefly too, on this issue of uh, pre existing documents in this country. You know, uh, historically speaking, you can say, you know, we've had a you know, national development plan. I used to hear by 2010, 
Nigeria will do this. Later, it will come by 2020. <laughs> you know, you know all those projections. So initially, it was yeah, 2000. Yeah, there was 2000. Uh, uh, how's it for all? Adding 10, 10, for all? Adding 10, 10 years. Head for all <laughs> by the year 2000. As if year 2000 is, is for in the moon. We are here. We are, we are there. So they looked far ago. then. It looked far so then. they were using it to deceive exactly. us. That was 23 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Obomale, uh, uh, can we revisit uh, uh, pre existing documents to save us this issue of going to do meetings in clusters, meeting the uh, NLC, meeting uh, this group, meeting this. We have met them before. Governments have met them before. There are documentations that show that. And providing, you know, providing solutions, even in Cardinal, where you are, as a vice prime chairman of a peace uh, uh, committee, you have been keeping peace. But there is also crisis, almost, almost on a weekly basis. So you ask yourself, why is my remedies not working? Because if it is working, the crisis will stop. So what are we saying? And there may be documents again on the issue of Kaduna that may not have been visited. There may be solutions there. All right. So generally speaking, can we go back to pre-existing documents that have been properly articulated for us to move ahead? Um, I, I think there is no negotiation with respect to references because in everything once you do not know the past, you may hardly understand the present and it becomes much more difficult to plan for the future. So nobody should underrate that. I think that is why in other forums we have strongly spoken about these national archives. To what extent is this country maintaining its strategic records, its strategic information, and making those information available to policy, high-level policy makers? So this is very important. And like you rightly said, all these reports, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. Let us take those things that have already been put in place and actualize their implementation. And how do we implement this? It's by reaching out to those stakeholders wherever they are and doing that. So I think in line with uh, the discussions that is ongoing, we would, it will be very important to see uh, the administration bringing in representatives from the National Assembly, representatives from the various states, representatives from the Federal Executive Council to sit down and look at some of these critical national issues, bring out those policy recommendations that we already met and then work out mechanisms for implementing these initiatives. I think there is no second way uh, about it. It's just the right thing to do, and we do hope that we will see it being done. You know, previously, budgets, annual budgets, were defined by national development plans. But today, we are seeing uh, annual budgets trying to define development uh, plans. It cannot work that way. Budgets have to look at the longer framework and be aligned so that budgets over the next one, two, three, four, five years will contribute to the attainment of a specific national development goal. And I think that was the importance. We do know that, for example, the previous administration, for example, the economic recovery and growth plan, we are all part of these things we are envisaging as national development plans. But indeed, they are quite not as robust. Well, uh, Dr. Saleh Bomale, we are running out of time and we have to, of course, appreciate you and the insights that you have brought into to this conversation. Uh, as we have indicated, the President's inaugural address uh, is one that will continue to crunch uh, and milk for uh, the real worth of it and the uh, many ramifications uh, that are inherent there in before, because, of course, we'll get the... Uh, fuller uh, issues arising there from in terms of the items that uh, he has also indicated. Executive Vice Chairman, Kaduna Peace Commission, always a delight having you on Good Morning Nigeria from our Kaduna Network Center. From Benin, uh, we also have to appreciate uh, Professor Eddie Eragbe. Professor Eragbe, uh, thank you very much uh, for the short time you spent with us. Uh, of course, it was quite impactful. Uh, Professor Eddie Eragbe, former Dean Faculty of Arts at the University of Benin, Professor of History and International Studies. Thank you for being around. And here in the studios, uh, Ayo Oyalowo, a development economist. Uh, we thank you 
always for your insights and your suggestions. Thank you. So that's it for us and good morning Nigeria for today. Tomorrow is another day, same time, 7 o'clock in the morning. Look after yourselves. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I'm Kiri and Umayodu. Have a great day.